much the same as any other day for Mrs. Williams as she busily prepares her family's noon meal. But not so for her oldest daughter, Erlene, who excitedly tells her of the man who offered her a ride in his car as she left school this noon. But Mrs. Williams is not impressed, not even with the license number so carefully written on Erlene's school paper. But there is no doubt that she would very much be concerned if it were possible for her to read this man's troubled and frustrated thoughts. He is troubled by an urging inside that even he does not understand. Deep in his subconscious mind, he knows that he is wrong. But his rationalizations keep him from fighting his abnormal behavior. This man is a child molester. He is a dangerous, calculating criminal that knows no bounds in obtaining fulfillment of his desire. He is ill, mentally ill, and sensitive, with a wild, running imagination that will set him off at a moment's notice. While Lester's little victim fails to arrive home for lunch, the school receives a telephone call from a worried mother. The school secretary reassures the child's mother as best she can, but carefully writes down all of the information available that is relative to the incident. The school principal is notified of the missing girl and all of the information is carefully related to it. The principal is aware that missing children are not uncommon and prepares to search the school buildings and grounds where they usually are found playing with friends. The child's teacher is contacted and questioned and it is found that the little girl has not been seen since classes were dismissed for the lunch period. The teacher further substantiates the fact that the little girl always goes home for her lunch. A search of the buildings and grounds proves fruitless. There is but one more step to be taken before calling in the police for help, and that is the questioning of the other children who may have seen or played with the little girl. They are all asked the same questions as to whether or not they have seen their playmate, and the answers are all the same. No one has seen her since the lunch period started. No one, that is, except one small, inquisitive boy who even now is not aware of what he has seen. Upon his arrival at the playground, he too is questioned by the teacher regarding the little girl's disappearance. But this time, there is a different answer. And after hearing his story, there is no doubt left as to what action has to be taken and quickly.
A call is immediately put through to the police department and the child's mother as the latest bit of information is obtained. And in a few moments, the police officer assigned to duty in the area arrives. He is told briefly what has happened and given a complete physical description of the child and her clothing. The officer carefully writes down each bit of information in preparation of relaying the details to police headquarters in order that a radio broadcast may be transmitted to all police units and an immediate search may be launched. Shortly after the arrival of the uniformed officer, a team of investigators working out of the juvenile bureau arrived to begin the formal investigation. The policewoman and detective assigned to the case begin by gathering every bit of information available in an attempt to work out a logical plan of action. The investigation is launched with the re-questioning of the little boy. It is learned that the suspect has black hair and that he wore a sport shirt without a tie. The boy remembers that the car was old and light in color, and he tells the investigators where the little girl was picked up and in what direction they traveled. Past this point, he knows nothing. The other children are also questioned in hope that someone might remember seeing some little thing that would help. But the answer is the same as before. They know nothing. Then one little girl offers the information that she knows something that happened the day before, but she didn't think it would help because her mother had told her to forget it. Prompted by the officer, she tells them of the man who wanted to give her a ride and of his old light-colored car. She says she did just as the teacher told all of the children to do if something like this should happen. She wrote down the license number of the car. In the meantime, all available police units are conducting a citywide search for the little girl and her abductor. With the new information and the license number to look for, the search is more pointed, and in addition, to the local radio broadcast to all Fresno police units, the information is transmitted to all law enforcement agencies in the Central Valley, and teletype bulletins are issued throughout the state. With the investigation underway, the detectives return to police headquarters where they anxiously await a return radio call from the Department of Motor Vehicles in Sacramento regarding the name of the person to whom the license number is registered. While waiting, they correlate their information and activities to make certain that no stone has been left unturned in the search for the little girl. Before word is received from Sacramento, they are notified by telephone that a patrol car has found the vehicle and the suspect is in custody. They are told the little girl is safe and unharmed and is being taken home to her mother. With his arrest, the molester's world of abnormality crumbles. He is frightened, confused, and embarrassed. He can give no reasons for his actions because he does not understand them. He is now even unable to rationalize, and his conflicting values begin to take their toll in mental anguish. He is a criminal by definition and will be punished as prescribed by law. Part of his punishment will result in treatment of his mental disorder. It is hoped that the treatment will prove successful. The problem does not end with the solving of this or any number of other cases. Rather, it begins here in the home with each individual family. 
It is difficult to picture the dangers involved in child molesting against the background of peace and security in our homes. And it is easy to entertain the idea that it can't happen to us. But in this home, it almost did. As the realization of what the police told Mrs. Williams takes effect, it is difficult for her not to feel guilty. But she is aware that Earlene's good judgment was formed in this same environment. The only environment where the basic values and attitudes can be learned through the faith and security afforded by the closely knit group known as the family. As in all other endeavors of life, the family has rules. One very common rule is that of bedtime at a certain hour for the children. There are other rules of importance that must be initiated in family routines. And the Williams have learned this lesson well. So they breathe a little easier now, but are more than ever aware of their responsibilities. They realize that they can never let up, but must constantly remind the children of the rules that will keep them safe from the problem of the child molester. They hope you too will do your part in this crime prevention program, which can be compared to a family insurance plan initiated by you. It costs you nothing, but can save you everything. Thank you.